Good evening. We're coming to the holiday of Purim. And we know that one of the holidays that's not going to disappear when Mashiach comes is the holiday of Hanukkah and the holiday of Purim. Purim is very significant because it says concerning Purim, Kimu Ayehudim Bekiblu. The Jewish people during Purim, our sages teach us, they were able to accomplish what they first received a thousand years before, which is the Torah. Which means that at the time of Purim, when the decree of Haman was there to destroy any reminiscence of the Jewish people, the Jewish people had to stand strong and hold on to their identity and were ready to sacrifice their lives. And therefore, even though we received the Torah at the time of Matan Torah, a time where everything was completely above and beyond nature, God revealed himself at Sinai. We were literally able to see the voices and to hear what is seen, meaning that the reality of godliness became so close to us and the reality of the physical realm became a reality which was far away from us. Nevertheless, seeing God descend on the mountain, open the heavens and reveal himself to every single one of us, that didn't mean yet that we received the, the Torah. You see, there are two ways to receive. You have sometimes an extraordinary light that comes to you and actually nullifies all of your being, meaning you, it subjugates you because it's so awesome. You have situations where you're taken by the situation and you're so taken that at this moment you lose it and you're ready to accept everything. But for whatever reason, after that happens, you revert to the person you were before. How come? How come we feel inspired, in awe, we feel elevated, we feel connected, and the next day is like the day after. You go back and you revert to what you are. Because essentially there are two types of revelations. There's a revelation which takes you from above and it's so awesome that you lose who you are and you are just receiving at this moment. You're under the influence of the great light that is shining upon you. And then you have another situation. Another situation which is a situation where you work on yourself, you are fighting with your nature, you're fighting with your mouth not to say that word which is not kind, you're fighting with your eyes not to look in a direction you're not supposed to, you're fighting with your ears not to listen to things which are not nice, you're fighting with your body not to get excited by things of the physical world and the animalistic drive. And at that moment, you might fall, fall and fall again, over and over again and again and again. But nevertheless, as you work on yourself, you're actually making a little progress from day to day, from time to time, and you're actually becoming more refined. And the more refined you become, the more you become a vessel for the great light of God. So basically, there are two periods in the history. There is the great event of Matan Torah. God gives us the Torah and reveals himself at Sinai. The Talmud of Shabbat in page 88 says, I'll call dibur ve dibur matan. For every word that God said, we could not contain 
the word of Hashem, our souls literally left our bodies and God had to res bring us back to life. Resuscitate us. So, the first word, I am the Lord your God. The second utterance, you should not have any other but gods before me. Then we said, stop, God. Moshe, you speak. You give the Torah to us. About a thousand years later, we are in a situation where 127 countries are under the dominion of one evil king by the name of Achashverosh. Haman cannot stand the Jews and decides to make a decree that in one day on all 127 countries, all Jews should be exterminated. There was absolutely nowhere to escape. The decree of this great holy war, jihad against the Jews, was declared, and that's it. At that moment, for a full year, the Jewish people had to stand b'mesirut nefesh with self-sacrifice and actually not even think for a second to give up their religion, give, give up their connection to God. And because of that great mesirut nefesh, that great self-sacrifice, they were able to be saved. And the miracle of Purim happened. It happened in the most natural and surnatural way at the same time. Our sages say on this period, Kimu vekiblu hayeudim. The Jewish people at this moment were able to accomplish and internalize what they had already received a thousand years before. At the moment of Matan Torah, we had a great revelation, but we were not the vessel for it. We did not necessarily deserve to have such a revelation, and we were not refined enough to be able for this revelation to permeate our being. At the time of Purim, in the act of self-sacrifice, of Mesirut Nefesh, at that moment, the given Torah has now been received by the Jewish people. Therefore, Purim is a very special time. Because Purim, because the events of Purim happened in what seems to be externally a natural sequence of events, and there is a verse that says, Yodu Lashem Chazdo Otav Livne Adam, blessed, praise God and thank God for his kindness and for the uh, wonders that he, that he does for man. Over there, our sages explain this verse to mean that we're talking about the wonders and miracles that God, God does for us and that we do not even recognize because they're hidden within nature. Sometimes when things are hidden within nature, we might think that the quality of the miracle is a lesser miracle than a miracle which is above nature. It's not true. The miracle which is above nature is God breaking nature. The miracle which is in nature, within nature, is actually a part of nature, revealing itself and actually partnering up with this great revelation of God. A Jew, by nature, is above nature. And therefore, we have that power inside of us to be able to connect to this higher level. Purim has that dimension. Purim actually is the time that the highest level of the soul is revealed. When we hear the word Purim, and we hear the word Kepurim, Kipurim, Kipur, the holiday of Kippur, the holiest day of the year where the high priest made a lottery between the two goats on which one would be sent down the cliff to atone for the Jewish people's sins and which one would be offered as a sacrifice. So too on Purim, <clears throat> which is the root of the word Pur, which means a lottery, there was a lottery to determine when the Jewish people would actually be exterminated, God forbid. What is a lottery? A lottery is something which is completely above and beyond any type of logic. Now, what 
We know. Why do we make a lottery on Purim? On Yom Kippur, I'm sorry. Because we actually are revealing the level of the essence of the Jewish people. The Jewish people, logically speaking, have nothing to do with logic. It has to do almost with something which is of the level of the lottery. Above and beyond any logical explanation. And therefore, in Yom Kippur, we reveal this level of connection. And therefore, because we reveal that essential, quintessential level of connection, that's why we pray five prayers to show that it's not only that we are connected at the level of the mechanical soul, which is called the nefesh, which is the first level of the soul, not only the second level of the soul, which is the spirit, which is ruach, not even the third level of the soul, which is the intellectual soul, which is called neshama, not even chaya, the level of the will of the soul, which is the life force of the soul, but the quint essence, the fifth level, which is yechidah nefesh. On this level, this is what happens on Yom Kippur. We pray five prayers to actually reveal that quintessential connection where you don't calculate when your son, if he behaved or misbehaved, he is your son and he's coming back, you open your arms and welcome him back. That's what happens on Yom Kippur. On Purim, there was a lottery as well, but a lottery to destroy the Jewish people. But because it was done in the level of a lottery, and the Jewish people are, connection, are connected to God in a way which is above logic. Therefore, the lottery failed because of our extraordinary connection, quintessential connection to God. The difference is that on Yom Kippur, in order to elevate ourselves and connect ourselves to that quintessential level, we disconnect ourselves from physicality. Anything which is physical, food, drink, etc., we separate ourselves from it. And we become like angels, which are, so to say, disconnected from the bodily desires, the physical desires. We're just like at the level of Matan Torah, of the giving of the Torah. Which, by the way, the second tablets were given on Yom Kippur. Second Ten Commandments. While on Purim, we actually, they wanted to destroy our bodies. We put our bodies in a situation where we were ready to give our lives for God, and therefore we integrated the Torah. We sanctified our beings, and we're able to now connect and celebrate with God, not in a way of fasting and infliction, rather in a way of celebrating and drinking and rejoicing. These are two levels in Teshuvah in return. There is Teshuvah Mi'ir'ah and Teshuvah Me'ahava. There's the level of return which is out of fear and awe. The great revelation is now has set upon me. And then there is the level of Teshuvah of return out of joy. The joy of being able to celebrate. Celebrate with food, with a drink, with wine. Nichnas yain, yatsasot. The wine comes in, the secrets come out. And what is the ultimate secret? It's that secret bond we have with our most intimate level of godliness which is inside of us. And this is what we celebrate on Purim. And that's why we put masks and we put costumes. Because in essence, we recognize that even though we look like everybody else at the physical level, it's one big costume. Our true essence is a connection which is completely above any level that is connected with nature. But nevertheless, we are able to connect heavens and earth within ourselves. And we're able with joy, with simha, to transform and to reveal the true connection we have to God. Simha. There is a discussion, I don't know if we mentioned it last time, in the Talmud of 
Psachim, I think on page 117. Over there, there's a discussion concerning the Psalms of King David. Sometimes we say Mizmor le David, a song for David. Sometimes we say Le David Mizmor, for David, a song. So the question is, what is the difference? It seems to be exactly the same thing. So our sages teach us, whenever it says Mizmor le David, a song for David, it means that King David started singing. And when he started singing, at that moment, the presence, the divine presence of God started residing, dwelling upon David Amelech. What does it mean, le David Mizmor, for David a song? It means that the presence of God resided on King David, inspired him, and then he started singing. Our sages teach us from there, le lametcha she'en hashchina shora, to teach you that the shchina, God's presence, cannot dwell, lo mitoch atzvut, not in a person which is depressed, lo mitoch atzlut, not in a person which is lazy, lo mitoch shok, not a person which is laughing, lo mitoch kalut rosh, not in a person which is uh, light-headed, ve lo mitoch dvarim betelim, and not with idle talk, through idle talk, when a person rejoices with a mitzvah, at that moment, he is able to have the presence of God dwell upon him. The Ariya Kadosh explains in Sha'ro Rua HaKodesh, where he explains how to get divine inspiration. And he says like this, actually it's Rabbi Chaim Vital, his student, says, my teacher was careful with two things. Normally, in order for people to be able to have the divine inspiration of God, they have to fast and clean themselves. If they were angry, for each time they were angry, they have to fast 151 fasts. For each time they drank non-kosher wine, 73 fasts. For each time they did some impure things, uh, 84 fasts. Guys were not out of the woods. So... Rabbi Chaim Vital says, how do you get divine inspiration? He says, my teacher, the Arya Kadosh Rabbi Yitzhak Luria Ashkenazi, got divine inspiration through two things. He was very careful with the blessings that he said on food, which means that the connection, to be able to connect the physical object and connect it to its source, he was very careful to say it with kavanah, to be able to recognize in a piece of food the godly spark, that spark of godliness which is hidden, and reveal it. And the second thing is, whenever he did a mitzvah, whenever he had the opportunity to do something good, he did it with great joy. And that is something which is very, very powerful. We all want success. How do, you define, how do you define success? People think success means you have a nice house on the ocean and you have to pay $150,000 of taxes. I don't know if that <clears throat> paying that amount of property taxes is called success. Might be success for the government. I don't think that is success. What is success? Success is living in a state of balance and perfect fusion with who you are at your essence. I am happy with who I am. I'm so happy with who I am, I want to be more of that self. I want to be more connected to my source. When a person is able to rejoice every second with the fact that he is connected to a higher source, he recognizes that inside of him he has a piece of the Creator. Now let's think about this for a second. I am a creation. Okay? But inside of me, God put inside of me a piece of Him the creator. 
I'm a creation, but I have a piece of the creator. So what happens if all day I'm going to contemplate on all my problems and all my difficulties and everything that I have to deal with in the physical world, that will only limit me. The moment that I start contemplating on the greatness of God, the more I recognize the greatness of God, the more humble I am. But the more humble I am, the greater I am. How does that work? The Zohar Kadosh teaches us, Mandei Uzair Iu Rav. The person which is small is the person which is great. The American uh, proverb made it short. Less is more. So, how does that work exactly? I would say that selfless is more. But what does that mean, practically speaking? The more I recognize, I was two weeks ago on a European tour speaking, and I went to Lausanne in Switzerland. And with divine providence, I went to visit one of our members' son, which is studying in the mountains. And I went up in the mountains, and I will tell you that somebody that was once at the synagogue in 2011 heard I was coming and offered me to uh, ski for an hour. So I went to ski for an hour in the Swiss mountains, a dream I've always had, never thought it would happen. But while in the mountains, you look at the beautiful sight, it's very, very, it takes you over. It's, oh, it's amazing the creation of God. When you're at a mountain, you know, it's very special. Now, what happened? Once you're on the top of the mountain, you realize more the greatness of God. At this moment, you feel very, very small. But the moment you feel very small, you might say, who am I and what am I? But once you realize more the greatness of God, you become more humble. But once you realize more the greatness of God, you realize that that same God that you fear and that is so awesome, you have a part of Him inside of you. You have a part of the Creator inside of you. And therefore, as small as you feel and humble as you feel, at the same time, you feel you have an extraordinary power. And the more humble you are, the greater power you realize you have. You have the power of the Creator. So as we mentioned last time with our mouth, we could speak and create a reality. Baruch she'amar ve'haya ha'olam. God said and the world came into existence. The words that we use can actually create reality and reveal the reality. Purim is the time that we realize that not only our souls are special, but the purpose of the soul is to be integrated within the body. At the time till the Baal Shem Tov came to the world, many, many great rabbis taught that the only way to really feel connected to God is to separate oneself from the physical realm. Like others do when they go in ashrams, or others do when they separate themselves and not get married. It's not true. The more you're involved in the physical world, and the more you become a master of your world. What does the Torah tell you? The Torah doesn't tell you not to eat. It tells you to be in control and not let the food take you over. And therefore you can't mix milk and meat. You can't eat certain things. Because you don't want that the world should be your master. The Torah is not telling you not to have intimate relations. It's telling you how to have intimate relations. The Torah is not telling you to separate yourself and meditate and only do that, but rather bring that the presence of God should be a part of the physical reality. The moment you do that, you actually gather the godly sparks which are in the physical 
and you reveal a much higher level of godliness than if you would separate yourself from physicality. Let me give you an, an example. Let's talk about food. <clears throat> we all struggle with food, I think. The Ariya Kadosh asks a question. He says, it doesn't make sense. It says, Ki lo levado adam, ki al kol Hashem adam. Man does not live only on the bread that he eats, but rather on the, on the word of God. What does that mean? Comes Yari Kadosh and asks a question. There are four realms, mineral life, vegetable life, animal life, and mankind. How in the world is it possible that something which is lower than us, how can that give us vitality? Mineral life which is below me can give me, vegetable life and animal life can give me vitality? It's lower than me. I'm at a higher level. Imagine, God forbid, a person that has a very low red cell, count of red cells. Are you, would you ever think or imagine even for a second to go and give him a transfusion of somebody that he has an even lower level of, a level, low count of red blood cells? Never. You would give him actually maybe stem cells in order to boost his system, something which is of a higher level. So how come what is lower than us elevates us to a higher level? In Kabbalah, there is a concept that says, Kol agavua, agavua biyoter, yored mata mata biyoter. The higher something is in its source, the lower it falls. Why is it like this? Because the higher something is, the more it has power to be able to elevate to the lowest levels. And therefore, mineral life, which is inanimate, in its source, actually comes a mineral and vegetable and animal life comes from the word of tohu. There are two dimensions. There's the world of order, which is called in Kabbalah olam ha-tikun, and there is olam ha-tohu, the world of chaos. I always like to say in Ashkenazi, how do you say the word anger? Chaos. <coughs> chaos. <laughs> What happens? What is the world of chaos? In Kabbalah, it explains the world of chaos is great light, very small vessels to contain the light. And therefore, it's too much. The world of order is the world of balance. The creation of man, man comes from Olam Atikun. The head is above the heart. The emotions are not in their full power. They can actually intertwine and work together. Kindness and severity can work at the service of the other. In the world of chaos, in the world of chaos, right, it is not possible to have two opposite emotions at the same time. If you have love, it's love all the way. If you have, you have severity, it's severity all the way. You can't have a balanced love and you can't have balanced severity. So in the world of chaos, everything is very powerful light. In the world of order, which is where man emanates from, Everything is in a perfect order. One thing serves the other, everything is balanced. So even though mineral, vegetable, and animal life are under man, their source comes from a higher level, which is the world of tohu, bohu, the world of chaos. Therefore, it has tremendous energy which is contained there, godly energy. Man, on the other hand, doesn't have at a physical level that same energy because it doesn't come from such a high source. When man takes a cup of water 
And says a bracha, she'akol niya bidvaru. Blessed are you, God, that everything was created with your speech. At that moment, he connects that spark of godliness to its source, reveals that tremendous energy which is in the water. And it's not only on the bread, on the water that he lives, but rather on the spark of godliness which is inside the element of physicality. So me shying away from physicality and saying it's not for me, I want to be a spiritual being, I want to meditate and contemplate and disconnect myself, is not actually the purpose of why we were created. We were created in order to permeate, integrate the world with spirituality and reveal the godly power which is in every single thing. How do we do that? With Mesirut Nefesh, with self-sacrifice, with self-control. The moment that we do that, our soul actually is, has a certain vitality that it didn't have before. The moment that I, actually it's interesting, there's a verse, that says, Zevulun lechof yamim. It says that Zevulun, there were two brothers, Issachar and Zevulun. Issachar was the man of Torah. He was studying all day and all night. Zevulun lechof yamim would go and work in import, export, to take the boat, go to China go to Japan, go here, go there, go to Las Vegas, Guatemala, I don't know. Wherever he went, he went. Chicago. And what happens is that Zevulun would give, of the money that he made, he would give 10 or 20% to support the Torah that Issachar would study. And like this, they would have exactly an equal portion of merit between both of them. I saw a beautiful explanation from the Panim Yafot of the Baal Ha'afla, a great holy rabbi, one of the students of the Magid of Mezrej. He says, the businessman went away to different countries, and by doing business in these countries, he revealed the sparks of godliness. By supporting the Torah that the student or the rabbi or the teacher was studying, the teacher was able to take these sparks of godliness and connect them to their source. So this association between the two worlds of the spiritual and the physical, the outside and the inside, is a complete cycle that permits to bring, a, a, that brings about a tremendous shefa bracha, a tremendous abundance upon everyone, the businessman and the one that studies. And like this, this association actually makes and transforms this world into a dira lo idvarach, a home for God where God is revealed within the world. And this is something we should know. What happened at Purim is that the Jewish people did not only receive the Torah, they actually integrated the Torah. They were ready to give their physical bodies for the Torah. That is self-sacrifice. I would like to conclude with a story. One day, the great Rabbi Israel of Rujin, a very holy, holy Rabbi, was told a story. He heard that there was a Gabbai Tzedaka, somebody which would collect funds for charity that was uh, buried in Poland. And when the Poles wanted to do a railroad track through a Jewish cemetery, they had to move all the bodies. A man which was buried for over 50 years, the Gabbai Tzedakah, the Tzedakah collector of the city, his body 
was whole. And not only was whole, he was wearing the clothing of a bishop. So Rabbi Israel of Rujin, when he heard this story and passed through this city, decided to stop and see the elder person of the city to find out exactly what happened over there. And he told them the following story. Maybe I'm getting a little mixed up. And Rabbi Israel of Rujin is part of the story of this elder. There was a woman, a widow, which didn't have enough to marry off her daughter. She went to the Gabay Tzedaka. The Gabay Tzedaka was a man that would knock at doors and ask for the widows and for the orphans and for the needy. And would be many times in a very embarrassing type of situation in order to collect for others. Actually, our sages teach us in the Talmud, Gadola ma'ase mina ose. It is greater to get others to give charity than to give yourself. You give yourself, okay, I got rid of it. But to go and to go to your friends, you want to give to, it's already a little too embarrassing. You know, just take my donation, I'll give you a little more. Don't ask me to do any more than that. So, the Gabbai Tzedakah would actually always put himself in these situations, and one day this widow came to him and said, I need to marry off my daughter. The Gabbai said, uh, I'm sorry, I went to every person in the city, nobody wants to see me anymore, everybody's slamming their door and, uh, at my face. And she insisted, but how can you leave an orphan girl? So he said, I'm going to try. He went to the, a very wealthy man, this very wealthy man, sick and tired of seeing him and said you know what I'll make a deal you're in so much you're insisting that I should give you that 10,000 rubles to marry this marry off this young girl if you are willing to go with the clothing of a bishop and a broom between your legs and make a fool out of yourself in the city I will give you the money lo and behold the Gabai went in the city. Everybody thought he completely lost his mind, made fun of him, and he got the money. One day, Rav Israel of Rujin went through the city and knocked at his door. And the Gabai opened the door and saw this very holy man and said, how can I help you? He says, I, I need to go in here. Can you please open the closet? He said, no. Please open the closet. He opens the closet and he sees that garment of the bishop. And he starts smelling it and it smells very special odor. And he says, you know that this garment smells like the odor of Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden. Tell me the story. <coughs> and the Gabba was very embarrassed, but he told the story. And the rabbi told him, you have to know that this self-sacrifice that you had it's so tremendous. When you get buried, you should get buried with this clothing. And that's exactly what happened. And therefore, when they found his body, even after 50 years they deterred his body, it wasn't touched. It says that when Mashiach comes, it is not our soul which is going to nourish our body, it's our bodies which will nourish our souls. When we do a mitzvah, and when we do it with joy, we connect parts of our physical body to the infinity of godliness. We reveal the godly soul within the body, a much higher level of our soul. And therefore, what we invest now in our bodies is what's going to nourish us tomorrow. And we actually eternalize our bodies. That's what the Jewish people did at the time of Purim. And that's what we can do each time we do a mitzvah, each time we do it with joy, and each time we do it with self-sacrifice. We can make our physical bodies be eternal bodies, eternal godly bodies. And that's why Purim 
is so great that if you're going to rejoice in the mitzvah of Purim, it is even greater than Kippurim. The word Kippurim means like Purim. Purim, which is the way to serve God with your physicality, with joy, that is the ultimate return to Hashem. Because it's a return which is with joy and with love. And when you really celebrate Purim in that way, and you give others charity, and you give the different types of food to another person, you participate, and you show unity, and you show love and caring for one another, at that moment, God says, Ah, this is the body that I've chosen. Asher bachar banu mikol amim, as the Alter Rebbe explains, that God chose our physical bodies not only our souls. And at that moment, we really elevate our bodies to another level and we could really be a true holy nation. Chai.